3. Land of the Living Prince Beyond High Sarai, July 11th Upwards into the Pagman Mountains the narrow road led, at 2,000 feet, through flint-strewn defiles and across gorges spanned only by rope bridges, often with a drop of several hundred feet. Hardy wheat actually grew at these heights, in fertile patches, and villages built of stone clustered against the towering mountain walls. Some peaks were snow-capped in midsummer, soaring as high as 25,000 feet. The camels, now unable to stand the conditions, had to be sent back. The caravan, both animals and people gasping for breath in the rarefied air, at times could move only at a snail's pace. Bala! Bala! Upwards! Upwards! The melting snow on the lower ranges was the worst cause of landslides at this time of year. Often the fallen boulders were piled so high on the rock-hewn ledges that it took hours to manhandle them out of the way. Meeting another file of animals coming in the opposite direction meant again and again one or other backing along the ledge until it came to a place where the path was wide enough for two horses to pass at once. It was six days into the journey, and everyone was blistered with sunburn from the ultraviolet light, in spite of the mixture of grease and charcoal which they smeared on their hands and faces. A day beyond High Sarai, where the villagers had treated the people of the caravan well, with meat and drink and even applause as they left, the mules moved more and more reluctantly. Hired, with their muleteers, from the Sarai, they were not accustomed to the northwards journey, and the increasing altitude now troubled them. Bala! Bala! Viciously, one of the mules kicked at its owner, who was trying to urge it around an especially difficult curve in the path, studded with slippery, cobble-like stones. The man lashed at the mule, losing his temper, just as they reached a spot where the path widened. In a second, the animal had turned and snapped at the man, its eyes rolling and its lungs gasping for breath. Its teeth sank into his shoulder, going right through the thickly padded mountain coat into the flesh and held on fast. The mountaineer, screaming with agony, flailed about while the mules in front and behind started to buck and kick. Before anyone could see exactly how it happened, the mule and the muleteer were over the edge, bumping and rolling to their deaths in the valley floor, 500 feet below. Adam edged his way past the remaining animals to see if anything could be done. Nothing could. The man and the mule lay some distance apart now, with no possibility of rescue or of climbing up. As Adam and the others watched through their binoculars, the badly injured man, knowing what his fate would be, rolled over slightly and drew his gun. At the first shot the mule jerked and lay still. The watchers turned away before the second report echoed from the rocks. Azambai had joined Adam now. His face was taut. Which mule was that? Mule number five, sir, Akramabasis, said one of the mountaineers. Adam, whispered Azambai in the eagle's ear, we have lost not only a man and a mule, we've lost all our money. What, both the gold and the reserve? That's right. I wanted it to be secure, so I put it in the panniers of the best mule and place the most reliable men front and back. I should have dispersed it, I see that now. Adam was not pleased. You are in charge of loading, and we must not fall out, whatever happens. But I don't like the idea of being completely penniless. We'll just have to manage, said the captain. They could not buy any more food or weapons now. They would not be able to pay for the lost mule and the hire of the ones they still had left. They would not be able to bribe their way out of trouble or reward anyone for services. There would be no way to buy information. 
That day they had covered seven parsangs, each parsang the distance a horse could travel in an hour. Let's call a midday halt when we get to a cultivated spot, said the eagle. Azambai agreed, feeling his way along the rock face towards his place at the head of the convoy. Bala, Bala! Always upwards, the caravan inched forward, the air getting thinner by the minute. The travellers began to feel mountain sickness, which made them want to lie down and sleep, some with hallucinations and a constant drumming in their heads, the torture of the mountain demons, which even acclimatization does not overcome. At one point the muleteers refused to go any further and had to be threatened with guns. As the sun was declining, mercifully, the road began to descend, passing through surprisingly lush but uncultivated land. Wild pomegranate, pear trees and cedars, lower-growing vegetation replaced the eternal pines. The animals sensed the improvement first and started to quicken their pace, in spite of the treacherous, gravelly stones underfoot. Then, as if to dash their hopes, nature produced another trick. A wide, rushing torrent, fed by the melting snows of Yellow Mountain, crashed straight across the mountain ledge along which the travellers were picking their way, completely blocking it. It was nothing less than a huge waterfall, and to the less experienced seemed an impossible barrier. Nur, towards the middle of the caravan, saw the captain arguing with the guide sitting on a black horse behind him, and the file of animals stopped. Surely they would not be able to get past this. Then she saw one man after another turn and pass a message to the one behind. Soon the Nuristani in front of her said, in broken Dari, Back up, we have to rush it. Pass it on. Haraka, get moving. Slowly, painfully, the whole string, some sixty animals, retreated along the treacherous ledge until Azambai's horse, in the lead, had a space of about twenty feet between it and the foaming water gushing from above and disappearing into the valley to the right. Azambai, as the others watched, kneed his horse and urged him forward, gaining enough impetus to plunge into the broad fall and to carry him through without being swept away. But supposing beyond the waterfall the road narrowed, or turned in a hairpin bend? Nur covered her eyes. When she looked again, the Turkestani and his horse had disappeared. Now it was the turn of the second man, the Turkoman guide, who had been this way before, and had obviously advised Azambai what to do. Without a moment's hesitation, he patted his horse's head, pulled on the reins, and then pushed them forward, the signal to leap. Instantly, the beautiful Katagan pony, long golden mane flying, launched himself towards the foam. As Noor watched, he vanished, as in a scene from a folk tale. Slowly, one by one, the people of the caravan passed through the water curtain, emerging on the other side soaked through, but safe and sound. Even the mules were prepared to make the leap, sensing, perhaps, that there was no other way. As each rider passed through this unprecedented baptism, the sensation, the shock of the icy water, and of going into the unknown, seemed to last for an age, though it could only have taken a fraction of a second. Beyond the waterfall, and hidden by its stark white sheets of water, plunging like an eternal veil, lay a small, neat valley with black tents pitched, sheep quietly grazing, children playing, and a group of women preparing a meal for the herders of the tableland. Steam rose from men, women, and horses as they plodded, almost automatically, towards this community human beings drawn irresistibly towards other humans, without reason or plan, feeling both misery and relief. An old man, limping from some injury or disease, came towards them and spoke in the rough diary of the mountain. Welcome. May you never be tired. May you be strong, Azambai said. May you live forever. 
you came well through the falling waters. May you find salvation. We did not know any other way to do it, the captain grinned, recovering his good humour. Where are we, friend? This is Tutabad, place of mulberries. Look. He indicated thousands of mulberry trees, some very large, which covered the hills around his valley. We are the people of Zindamir, the living prince, and those are our tents. They had meat, but it was for sale. They could not afford to give any of it away. Everything was measured, accounted for, in a frugal way which astonished the other Afghans, generally given to hopeless extravagance. But they soon realized that anything less than the most careful husbandry in this part of the mountains could lead to starvation, at least of protein. Kazim and the Nuristanis, however, having dried their clothes, went into the trees beyond the sheep meadows and came back an hour later with the carcasses of two fine white deer. There was food for both Mujahideen and nomads. The herdspeople brought out green tea, salt, beans, barley, and dried apricots. They had no guns themselves, and, unusually for mountain folk, did no hunting. They had obviously organized their lives around mutton and wild fruit and vegetables, bartering meat and wool for other things which they needed. Hunting did not appeal to them. Most of the animals here are foxes, lynx, wild cat, they said in answer to Adam's questions. He felt that it would not be polite to point out that they had seen herds of mountain goats, grouse, partridges, and plenty of the white, as well as brown, deer. We all have our own ways and customs, he said, and the twenty or so shepherds gravely agreed, rubbing the mutton fat into their beards as they sat around a fire made from brightly burning cedar wood. There were no Russians in these parts, nor did the writ of the Communist People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan run here either. The people were not nomads, for they had villages lower down the mountain. This was their summer pasture land, where they camped for months at a time, since it was too far from their houses to bring the sheep up every day. They had heard something about a change of regime, but only that it was not popular. Yes, caravans did sometimes come through from the north or south, but people did not stop to spend time or to talk with them. Caravan people always seemed in a hurry to be on their way. The shepherds showed little interest in the eagles' plans. To them, a caravan was a caravan, a body of people carrying on their own way of life, like the sheep people had theirs. They would take nothing for allowing the animals to graze on their ground, but bartered their delicious cake made of pounded walnuts and hazelnuts with honey for a few boxes of matches, a real luxury for them. Ordinarily, they explained, they kept a fire or two burning all the time to provide such heat and light as they needed. Adam fell asleep that night, thinking how idyllic a life it would be to become a sheep farmer in the high mountains, to build his own house, to hunt and fish and live on hazelnut bread and yogurt, forgetting the disaster of the lost money and the not very good prospects of a small band like his trying to attack the might of the Russian army at its great base of Kizil Kala. It was light when Adam woke. A man was leaning over him, holding a knife to his throat. Instinctively he reached for his rifle. It was gone. He sat up cautiously, and two more men came up and looped a thick rope around his body, trapping his arms. Everywhere he looked, other men, the muleteers and guides, were immobilizing his people. Nobody said a word. As Adam watched, the muleteers dumped all the arms, rifles, revolvers, grenades, even swords in a pile with two men to guard them. They herded the shepherds, who were completely unarmed, into another group and set guards on them. Then they started to rifle the baggage of the caravan. 
Either they were bandits, or else they had realized that they would not now be paid, and were going to plunder the caravan instead. It is hard to conceal anything from anyone on a caravan journey. Adam realized that these men probably knew that the gold had been on the lost mule in the ravine. There did not seem to be any hope. Adam caught Captain Azambai's eye. He was sitting up too, some distance away, looking wretchedly at the systematic, practiced sorting of the goods and chattels. He rolled his eyes and shrugged. Even if he had been near enough to talk, there was not much to say. Now the thieves were methodically searching everyone's pockets and taking watches, any money they could find, and small personal possessions. The burly Nuristanis growled as their crystal necklaces were taken away, but they were helpless too. Adam could not see where Noor was. At the angle at which he was sitting, trussed like a fowl, he could not even move to see what might have happened to her, or to Karima. The sheep people were sitting quietly, philosophically almost, on the ground, under the guns of their guards. They had probably learnt, over the centuries, that it was best to acquiesce in situations like this. They would either be killed or set free. Either way, it was the will of Allah. In any case, there was surely nothing that they could do. There was a Persian saying, Nabazar, Nabazor, Nabazar. Not money, not force, nor poison. Well, they had no money, no force, certainly no poison. That seemed to be that. They would probably be killed. The leader of the muleteers, known for some reason as Heran, the bewildered, was small and bent, almost hunchbacked with a low voice and an unassuming manner. Yet somehow he had become a leader, and the other men, some of them huge and villainous-looking, followed his orders without question. Adam found himself hoping that they would quarrel over the spoils, though how that might help him and his band he could not tell. In storybooks, of course, that was one of the possibilities. It took an hour or more for the looting to be completed and for the booty to be collected in neat piles on the green grass of the meadow. It was all done so quietly, so professionally, that Adam was sure that these robbers had done the same thing many times before. Even if they had not originally been attracted by the gold, he felt, the thieves would almost certainly have tried to rob the caravan. And the guards, four of them, posted the night before and due to be relieved every four hours, had not raised the alarm. They must have been silenced somehow. Had they been killed? Adam could not see any of them, or any dead bodies either, from where he lay. Heran had come to some sort of arrangement with the shepherds, who were nodding their heads. The two men guarding them were withdrawn and joined the rest of the robbers, now surrounding their leader. Then Heran was climbing onto a pile of saddles and boxes, arranged like a platform, around which the loot was neatly stacked. His men positioned themselves in a circle around him, sitting cross-legged on the ground. Evidently the shepherds had promised not to make any trouble when the guards joined the leader's audience. Heran stood, now atop the improvised platform, and addressed his men. He was making quite a long speech in the archaic form of diary which was used in these mountains, as Adam could tell from its cadence. But he was too far away to hear what was actually being said. Now and again the listening men laughed, sometimes they shouted. In the middle of one such shout, rising from the ever more animated leader of the robbers from whom Adam's eyes had strayed, there was a rattle of rifle fire. It came from a clump of trees some hundred yards from where Adam was lying and a hundred and twenty from the robber group. When he looked back to where the band had been sitting, Adam saw that they were sprawled in heaps, some evidently dead, others struggling on the ground, some tugging at the butts and barrels of rifles from the arms pile, 
trying to get them free to shoot at their attackers. He looked back towards the trees again. Some twenty men, dispersed in open array, were running very fast towards the robbers, stopping every now and then to fire into the mass. Nobody from among Heyran's men had been able to get a shot in before the newcomers were among them. Rapidly they formed a circle around their prey, first shooting at them and then covering them with their guns at the ready as all those who were on their feet, and some lying on the ground, raised their arms in surrender. The raiders were dressed in furs and leather trousers, with wide leather belts and crossed bandoliers. On their feet they wore soft, curly-toed Turkoman boots, and three or four of them, who seemed to be the leaders, had wolfskin, Mongol-type caps with flaps on their heads. Adam was trying to work out the meaning of this event when he felt a hand on his shoulder. He jumped, half turned around, and was surprised to hear Noor's voice. Stay still, or you'll get hurt. He felt her knife slash through the ropes which bound his arms. He stretched himself, wondering how she had done it and what to do next. Putting his finger to his lips, he signalled her to be still, in case the new arrivals saw her. She laughed. Don't worry, they're friends of mine. Friends? Yes. What do you mean, friends? Where are they from? Who are they? How do you know them? What's been going on? One thing at a time. She was enjoying the moment. As Adam stood up and tried to get his circulation going again, Captain Azambai came up, rubbing his wrists. With him was a tall, Mongol-capped figure. Adam shook the grinning newcomer's hand almost automatically as he said, when is someone going to tell me what is going on? I just went and collected these men to help us, said Noor. Where did you find them, and anyway, how did you get away from the camp? Last night I couldn't sleep. I saw Heyran giving a hot drink to the watch after stirring something into it. He gave some to all the men on guard. I guessed it was either poison or dope. I was scared and made quietly for the trees to decide what to do. I ran into some of these men. They turned out to be friendly. You're obviously the only intelligent person among us, said Azambai, perhaps relieved at not being the only one to have blundered. These fellows shouldn't have taken the drink. Must have had chas, hemp, in it. Why did you wait until dawn? Adam asked. To catch them at a moment when they were distracted. I am Torzan, which means brave in Pashtu, said the leader of their rescuers. That's the name my parents gave me. He prefers to be called Farid, said Noor. We are most grateful for your kindness and owe our lives to you and your men, Shaghali, Mr. Farid, said Adam, remembering his manners. It is my duty, said Farid, happily. We live beyond those trees there in a group of villages. These simple folk don't have much to do with us as we collect taxes from them for the Zindamir, the living prince, our chief. Living, of course, also means very great. That is his title. Well, who are these robbers? the captain wanted to know. They seem pretty experienced to me. Oh yes, they are indeed. The Mir has been after them and others like them for years. Did you say years? Adam asked. Yes, years. They are professional thieves. Their ancestors were known as the Assassins. They are sort of licensed killers. Legend has it that they originally followed a terrorist chief called Hassan, son of Sabah in Persia. He sent people out to kill for political reasons. They sometimes call themselves people of truth. The founder and his successors are supposed to be incarnations of a deity, a sort of god. Azambai said, That was the old man of the mountains, wasn't it? Sheikh al-Jabal? That's right. 
There are still pockets of them in Afghanistan, though not all of them are killers. A lot of them are respectable grocers and bakers, things like that. Some believe in murder, others say it's a heresy started by a splinter group centuries ago. I'll tell you more when we've had a little food. Farid led them to a spot beyond the tree screen where his men had spread a feast such as the travellers had not seen for a long time. The villagers had brought out loads of cooked meat, fruit, cheeses, any number of vegetables and sauces. What are you going to do with the robbers? Azambai asked. Farid said, That is nothing to do with me. Our men have already taken them to the prince. He may kill them or let them go or do anything he wants to. We must leave things like that to him. No trial or anything? Farid looked at him as people do when someone has made an improper remark. Perhaps there will be a trial, perhaps not. It is for the living prince to decide. That obviously disposed of that. As to the killing and robbing by these assassins, Farid said, it is all very simple. Their leader, the great imam whom they follow, is the incarnation of deity in their eyes. Therefore everything on earth belongs to him. If you or I have anything, it still belongs to him, so his followers can take possession of it. Adam knew that branches of the assassins were said to have terrorized whole nations in antiquity, but this persistence of their nests in Afghanistan was new to him. He said, People like that are undoubtedly a pestilential nuisance, to put it no higher. But what a weapon used against the Russians! To Adam's surprise, Farid took this seriously. He touched Adam on the arm. You ought to be a politician. I'll certainly mention it to the prince. He might well agree to your suggestion. But how could you keep control over them if you let them loose among the people again? Use the Russian method, of course. Take and keep hostages. Why, Hai Sarai is full of people we could pick and choose from. It's just that for all these years we did not know that they were assassins. It's definitely something to think about. Desperate remedies for desperate circumstances. Adam was glad that he did not have to make the decision. <laughs>